Today we're covering summary, themes, and symbol analysis in Go Went Gone by Jenny, by Jenny who? By Jenny Erpenbeck. If you stay until the very end of this video, I'll make sure to guide you to where you can find quote banks, sample essay topics, and also a sample essay topic breakdown so you can go away and practice with. As always, I think it's important that you're not just studying English for English sakes because that can make things pretty boring. So I try to make things meaningful for you by connecting them to real life examples so you can see why you're actually studying these texts. Let's get started. Go Went Gone revolves around an unlikely connection between a retired university professor, Richard, and the group of asylum seekers who come from all over the African continent. While he's enjoyed a life of stability and privilege as a white male citizen, the lives of these asylum seekers could not be more different. No matter where they are in the world, uncertainty seems to follow. Richard initially sets out to learn their stories, but he is very quickly drawn into their histories of tragedy, as well as their dreams for the future. However, the more he helps them, the more he realizes what he's up against, a potent mix of stringent legal bureaucracy and the ignorance of his peers. These obstacles are richly interwoven within the novel's context in post-reunification Germany, but bureaucracy and ignorance are everywhere. Australia included. More on this in the symbol section of this video. This novel, therefore, bears reflection of our own relationship with refugees who seek protection and opportunity on our shores. Refugees who are virtually imprisoned and cut off from the world. Richard ultimately realizes that these men are simply people. People who have the same complexities and inconsistencies as everyone else. They sometimes betray his trust. At other times, they help him return despite their social economic standing. The end of the novel novel is thus neither perfect nor whole. While the asylum seekers develop a relationship with Richard and vice versa, neither is able to entirely solve the other's problems, though both learn how to be there for each other in their own ways. We don't get many solutions to everything the refugees are facing, but what we end up with is a lesson or two in human empathy. The title of Jenny Erpenbeck's novel, Go Went Gone, is a line she weaves into a couple of scenes. In one example, a group of asylum seekers in a repurposed nursing home learn to conjugate the verb in German. In another, a retired university professor reflects on this group, about to be relocated to another facility. Themes. Privilege. The various privileges Richard holds shapes his identity in the text. It shapes how he approaches his retirement, for example, now that he has time. He plans to spend it on highbrow pursuits like reading or listening to classical music. On the other hand, the asylum seekers sleep most of the time. If you don't sleep through half the morning, a day can be very long indeed. Richard has the freedom to choose to spend his time on hobbies, but the asylum seekers face a daunting and seemingly impossible array of tasks. After getting to know them more, he realizes that while his to-do list includes menial things like schedule repairmen for dishwasher, the refugees face daunting socio-political problems like needing to eradicate corruption. Freedom in general is a useful way to think about privilege in this text, and besides freedom to choose how you spend your time, this can also look like the freedom to tell your story. Story. While Richard helps the men with this to some degree, even he has a limited amount of power here, and power can be another useful way of thinking about privilege. Richard realizes that people with the freedom to choose get to decide which stories to hold on to, and those are the people who get to decide the future of refugees at least from a legal perspective. Empathy. Though Richard can't necessarily help with these legal issues, he finds himself doing what he can for the refugees over time. He demonstrates a willingness to help them in quite substantial ways sometimes. For example, buying a piece of land in Ghana for Karan and his family. In the end, we see him empathizing with the refugees enough to offer them housing. Though he is not a lawyer, he still finds ways to use his privilege for good and share what he can. He taps into his networks and finds housing for 147 refugees. One tricky thing with empathy though is that it's never one-sided. Not in this book and not in real life either. It's not simply a case of Richard taking pity on the refugees. We might think of this as sympathy rather than empathy but he develops a complex, reciprocal, and real friendship with all of them. This can challenge him, and us, and our assumptions about what is right. When Richard loses his wallet at the store, Rufu offers to pay for him. He initially insists he can't accept, 
but when he does, Rufu doesn't let him pay back in full. Urban Beck challenges us to empathize without dehumanizing, condescending, or assuming anything in the process. It's an interesting way to think about social justice in general, particularly if you consider yourself an ally of a marginalized group. How can we talk with people rather than speak for them and what they want? I've touched on this idea a bit in my other video, which I'll link for you here. Movement. Movement is in some ways like privilege, but there's so much to say here that I've created its own section. There are lots of different forms of movement in the novel, in particular, movement between countries. Specifically, it's what brought the refugees to Germany at all, even though they didn't necessarily have any control over that movement. Contrast that with Richard's friends, Jörg, I hope that's how you pronounce it, and Monica, who holiday in Italy and benefit from freedom of movement as the right to travel. Through this lens, we can see that this is really more of a luxury that the refugees simply do not have. Refugees experience something closer to forced displacement rather than free travel, moving from one temporary place to the next, often outside of their control. In this process, their lack of control often means they lose themselves in the rough and tumble of it all, becoming foreign to yourself and others, so that's what a transition looks like. Symbols and analysis. Let's talk about language and the law. Many of the barriers faced by the refugees are reflected in their relationships with language. That is, their experiences learning German mirrors and sheds light on their relationship with other elements of German society. For example, there are times when they struggle to concentrate on learning. It's difficult to learn a language if you don't know what it's for. This struggle reflects and symbolizes the broader problems of uncertainty, unemployment, and powerlessness in the men's lives. The symbol of language often intersects with the symbol of the iron law, so these are discussed together here. It's hard on one hand for these men to tell their stories in German, but it's also hard for the German law to truly grapple with their stories. Indeed, Richard finds that the law doesn't care if there are wars going on or not. It only cares about jurisdiction and about which country is technically responsible for the refugees. In this sense, the law mirrors and enables the callousness which runs through the halls of power. Not to deter you from learning law if you want though. This might just be something to be aware of and something you want to change someday. There's one law mentioned in the novel stating that asylum seekers can be simply accepted if a country, a government, or a mayor so wishes, but that one word in particular, if, puts all the power in lawyers and politicians who know the language and the law and how to navigate it all. These symbols thus reflect power and privilege. Borders. Throughout the novel, there's a sense that borders between countries are somewhat arbitrary things. They can suddenly become visible and just as easily disappear. Sometimes they're easy to cross. Sometimes they're impossible to cross. Sometimes it's easy physically, but harder in other ways. Once you cross a border, you need housing, food, employment, and so forth. This complex understanding of borders draws on the history of Germany, and in particular of its capital, Berlin, after World War II. After the war, Western powers like USA, UK, and France made a deal with the Soviet Union to each run half of Germany and half of Berlin. The eastern half of Germany and the eastern half of Berlin fell under Soviet control, and as East Germans started flocking to the West in search of better opportunities, sound familiar? The Soviet Soviets built a war around East Berlin. The Berlin War, built in 1961, became a border of its own, dividing a nation and a city and changing the citizenship of half the Germany overnight. This history adds dimension to Erpenbeck's novel. Refugees pass through many countries, but Erpenbeck draws on Germany's history specifically as a once divided nation itself. This helps to illustrate that national borders are just another arbitrary technicality that divides people to the expense of these refugees. Now that you understand this text, I'm going to guide you to my A plus essay writing playlist where I answer frequently asked questions like essay structure, how to write an essay within an hour, how to be more concise size, how to find best vocabulary. So go on there to make sure that you can amp up your English studies and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!